So <laughs> thank you everybody that's uh, logged on. We appreciate you coming tonight with our webinar. So um, my name is Jamie Erickson. I'm the director and curator of the Hermosa Beach Museum. I've been with the group now for five years. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit, earlier before the official start time, uh, we started doing webinars during the pandemic and we're kind of keeping up with it periodically throughout our schedule, even though we've returned to in-person programming because it's a fun way to get in touch with people that aren't necessarily in LA, um, not just our audience, but also guest speakers. Here um, he is. Oh, cool, perfect timing. There he is. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark, <laughs> I'm just starting my spiel so you can give your, uh, you can give- Turn on uh, your sound. <laughs> you can give Carl's intro when I'm done. <laughs> And to take off your glasses because your your screen's reflecting off your glasses. <laughs> As you can see, we're a real formal bunch, um, but we do enjoy like um, coming up with really fun and new programming um, that we can share with everybody. So we are a registered nonprofit. Um, we're located in Hermosa Beach, um, just on the backside of the community center. If you've ever played tennis there, um, you can just look up at the building and you will see Hermosa Beach Museum in big letters. Um, so if you haven't visited the museum, please do come visit the museum sometime. Um, and we also wanna give a special shout out to all of our members. Um, our, their support is what makes this accessible and free programming possible. Um, so if you're in the area and you wanna to come to some of our in-person programming or just support us, check out our website, hbmuseum.org and uh, consider becoming a member or making a donation um, so that we can keep this up because it's really fun and enjoyable. And we get to chat with really awesome people like Carl. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mark Shoemaker. He's on our board of directors and one of our committee chairs, and he's going to do an introduction for our guest speaker for tonight's webinar. And turn on your mic, uh, Mark. Your, well, your sound's off. Oh yeah, unmute yourself. It's always helpful if we yeah. can hear you. There you go. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Mark Shoemaker. I'm the events committee chair and uh, this idea came to the Hermosa Beach Museum. We were talking about something unusual to do for the Halloween period of time. And we thought, what more than talk about, you know, missing people and and uh, talk about new technologies and finding missing people. And um, Carl and I grew up together in El Segundo. We both uh, were, were Catholic kids growing up there. And um, somehow he got involved in DNA and, um, I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. I've also had an interest in doing genealogy and have used DNA uh, for genealogy projects. So I'll let Carl talk a little bit more about his background um, and then we'll move ahead with the program. Okay. And I should, I'm sorry, I should also mention, I forgot Carl, sorry. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, we're gonna let Carl go ahead and do his presentation um, and you can go ahead and pop them during the presentation in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll address those at the end. Okay, great. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Carl Koppelman. I'm a volunteer with the DNA Doe Project. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you about who we are and what we do and how I became involved with the organization. And then I will discuss a recent case out of Redondo Beach that I was involved in. Back in 2017, the National Institute of Justice issued a report about the very large number of unidentified remains cases in coroner's offices across the United States. The author of the report described it using the word silent mass disaster. At the time, there were estimated to be about 40,000 such cases, and the number was growing at about 1,000 per year. And so for each of these cases, there's a person whose fate is unknown to his or her family. And in the vast majority of them, there's a family in search of answers. So typically, when an unidentified body is, uh, arrives at a coroner's office, there were traditionally four methods of identifying that person. Uh, the first method, the most common is visual identification. If someone knows the descendant, they can the decedent, they can bring them in and uh, visually identify them. Uh, secondly, there's fingerprints. They can either uh, manually compare the fingerprints or there's a national database called APHIS, uh, Automated Fingerprint Identification System. Uh, however, that requires one, that there are fingerprint records available to compare, and two, that the fingerprints of the decedent are not lost through decomposition. The third method is dental records. Uh, the National Crime Information System, uh, known as NCIC, uh, includes a means of automated dental comparison to missing persons, or if a potential identity is already known, dental records can be ordered from the missing person's dentist. 
And then finally, there's the, the combined DNA index system known as CODIS. Uh, it's been used since the early 90s by the federal government. Uh, CODIS utilizes the computerized method of comparing a small number of genetic markers called STRs, and they use this both in criminal cases and in unidentified remains cases. But to get a CODIS hit, there must be a profile for that person in the missing persons index. The person must be reported missing, and a family member needs to provide a family reference sample to be placed into the index. But if none of these methods work, then the cases remain unresolved, and sometimes they remain un unresolved for decades. So back in 2017, novelist and genealogy enthusiast Margaret Press teamed up with a retired rocket scientist named Colleen Fitzpatrick. Margaret had already been deeply involved in genealogy, helping adoptees find their biological families. Margaret had been aware of this problem of unidentified remains and came up with an idea. It occurred to Margaret that the same methodology she used to locate biological families of living persons could also be used to make identifications of these unidentified deceased persons where all the other methods had failed. Colleen had a very extensive network of friends in the academic circles that she frequented, including persons with expertise in genomics and bioinformatics. And so through that partnership of Margaret Press and Colleen Fitzpatrick, the DNA Doe Project was formed. So this is just a fraction of the former John and Jane Doe's whose identities the DNA Doe Project has restored. We have many more still in the pipeline. The DNA Doe Project, founded in October of 2017, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with the sole mission of resolving unidentified John and Jane Doe cases. Colleen also formed her own organization called Identifinders, which in addition to Doe cases also identifies perpetrators of violent crimes using DNA profiles developed from crime scene evidence. By my most recent count, we've made over 110 identifications. There are about 50 cases currently undergoing research. There, there are 13 cases under low, undergoing lab work, which is a three-step process. There's extraction, meaning you obtain the DNA extract from a biological sample. Secondly, they sequence it. Uh, that is, they convert it, that sample into a digitally formatted representation of the entire genome. And then the third step is bioinformatics, which is reducing that uh, that entire sequence genome into a file upload that, that includes only the specific markers to be compared. We currently have 85 volunteers to do the geneal genealogy research on these cases. The methodology is known as genetic genealogy, which is defined as the use of DNA combined with tr traditional genealogy to build out trees and infer relationships and to identify people much like what had been, been done with adoption searches. The terms forensic genealogy and investigative genetic genealogy are also used, and these terms would imply that there are legal ramifications to the case that involve the jurisdiction of a law enforcement agency or a coroner's office. Without going too deep into the woods here, I need to at least provide a Cliff Notes version of how the relatedness of two, pe two persons is measured. A unit of measure called a centimorgan, abbreviated with a lowercase c, uppercase m, is used to measure how closely two people are related. A centimorgan measurement can range anywhere from about zero to 30 to about 3,600, with zero being no detectable relation and about 3,600 being representing a parent-child relationship. Identical twins and two samples from the same person will also return a centimorgan reading of about 3,600. And as we move down the centimorgan scale, Full siblings will come in the vicinity of about 2,600 centimorgans. An aunt or uncle will come in around 1,700 with a niece or nephew. First cousins, about 1,000 centimorgans. Second cousins, about 250 centimorgans. And third cousins would come in under 200 centimorgans. The first, the first case the DNA Doe Project took on was that of a man who was living under the false identity Joseph Newton Chandler III. This man had committed suicide in 2002 and it was discovered that he had stolen the identity of a Texas boy who died in an automobile accident back in 1945. 
Margaret and Colleen had given a presentation to a group of persons from the law enforcement community. And in that pre presentation, they indicated that this methodology had great potential to resolve many of these cases. After the presentation, a person from the US Marshal Service approached them and expressed an interest in working with DNA Doe Project to try to identify this man. As Margaret and Colleen and the volunteers started working on the Chandler case, a couple of other agencies also expressed interest. One of these agencies was the Sheriff's Office of Miami County, Ohio. For 37 years, they had been trying to identify a woman who had come to be known as the Buckskin Girl. The Buckskin Girl was a young female homicide victim, estimated to be in her late teens, or early 20s, found in a rural roadside ditch near Troy, Ohio. This occurred in April of 1981. The nickname Buckskin Girl came from the distinctive leather jacket that she was wearing leather buckskin jacket that she was wearing when she was found. And as the DNA Doe Project volunteers got her profile into GEDmatch, they were very excited to see that she shared 415 centimorgans with her top match. A reading that high suggests that this person on the match list and the Jane Doe are either first cousins once removed or half first cousins. So as they proceeded through publicly posted family trees in Ancestry.com, they found a tree from a man named John Sossaman, who had listed his daughter as missing, presumed dead, or missing, assumed dead. Her year of birth in June of 1959 would have been would have meant that she would have been 21 years old in April of 1981 when Buckskin Girl died. This was precisely within the, the estimated age range of Buckskin Girl. And Mr. Sossaman's daughter was a first cousin once removed of the top match, which was exactly consistent with the estimate based on the 415 centimorgans of shared DNA. So at that point, it was very clear that the buckskin girl finally had a name. Marsha Lenore King Sossaman. On April 9, 2018, the Miami Valley Regional Crime Laboratory announced that they had identified buckskin girl as 21-year-old Marsha Lenore King Sossaman of Little Rock, Arkansas. This was the first ever announcement of the successful use of forensic genealogy, either in a criminal investigation or in an unidentified decedent case. 17 days later, on April 26, 2018, Joseph D'Angelo was arrested in connection with the Golden State Killer case and charged with and ultimately convicted of numerous murders and rapes dating back to the 1970s. The forensic genealogy research that led to his arrest was performed by Contra Costa DA investigator Paul Holes, working with genealogist Barbara Ray Venter. This was the first time a perpetrator in a criminal case was identified through the use of this method. And then, nearly two months later, on June 21st, 2018, the U.S. Marshal Service announced uh, the identification of the man known as Joseph Newton Chandler III. His true name was Robert Ivan Nichols. This was the very first case in which forensic genealogy had been attempted in this manner, and now it too had come to a successful identification. So I joined DNA Doe Project back in 2018. I have no background as a genealogy, or I had no background as a, as a genealogist. I, I'm a certified public accountant with a hobby as a forensic artist and an internet sleuth with about 10 years of experience researching Doe cases. My name made national news back in January of 2015 in relation to the identification of a 16-year-old homicide victim named Tammy Jo Alexander. For 36 years, she had been known only as Caledonia Jane Doe. The Livingston County, New York Sheriff's Office had spent decades and countless man hours trying to identify her. And while browsing missing persons listings, I spotted a listing for Tammy Jo and immediately recognized her as Caledonia Jane Doe. The announcement of that identification drew an enormous amount of media attention, and I became well known among true crime enthusiasts, not just because of Tammy Joe's identification, but also because of my hobby as a forensic artist who creates facial reconstructions for these unresolved Doe cases. And this is one of the early uh, facial reconstructions that I had done of Caledonia Jane Doe before I recognized this girl as, uh, um, as Caledonia Jane Doe. In 2018, I was contacted by one of the DNA Doe Project volunteers with a request for permission to use several of my forensic depictions in their public releases pertaining to Doe cases that they were working on. A few months later, they contacted me again 
and they had a, uh, a potential identity for one of those cases for which I had created an image. The woman, estimated to be in her 30s, was found murdered in 1982 on a hiking trail known as Sheep's Flat in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. And based on the location where she was found, she became known as the Sheep's Flat Jane Doe. The volunteer wanted me to take a look at a blurry photo from a 1966 high school yearbook of a girl named Mary Silvani taken nearly two de decades prior to the death of Sheep's Flat Jane Doe. The volunteer wanted my opinion as to whether I thought she could be Sheep's Flat Jane Doe. I told her I wasn't certain, but the, the facial dimensions were very consistent. And at that point, I was asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement because it was still not publicly known that they had a potential identity of Sheep's Flat Jane Doe. So upon signing the non-disclosure agreement, I was officially a, a volunteer for DNA Doe Project and I was invited to join a couple of teams of volunteers working on Doe cases. So in May of 2019, the Washoe County Sheriff, um, Nevada Sheriff's Department announced that through forensic genealogy, they were not only able to identify Sheep's Flat Jane Doe as Mary Silvani, but also the perpetrator of her murder, James Curry. And this was the first time that forensic genealogy was successfully used uh, to identify both the perpetrator and the victim of the same crime. Silvani's identity was identified by DNA Doe Project, and Curry's identity was, ident was solved through Colleen's group, Identifinders. But unfortunately, Curry was not able to be charged for the crime as he had committed suicide in his jail cell in 1983 while he was awaiting trial for three other murders. So at this point, I'd like to go into detail about a case out of Redondo Beach that we just recently resolved. So this is an overhead view of Aviation Boulevard heading southwest towards uh, um, towards Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, we're just south of uh, um, Artesia Boulevard here, and the red arrow here points to uh, um, the location where this Jane Doe that I'm about to discuss was uh, located. Uh, here is a photo of the uh, forensics team excavating the backyard where they located these remains. So on August 22, 2001, a construction worker unearthed a bag containing a partial human skeleton, which didn't include a skull. And this was on 1624 Wallacott Street in Redondo Beach. The Redondo Beach Police Department was contacted. Uh, and the LA County Sheriff's Department and FBI also became involved in the attempt to identify the remains. An anthropological examination of the bones revealed only that the bones belonged to a young adult female. And due to con the condition of the remains and the lack of a skull, it was impossible to make an identification by fingerprints or dental records. And also due to the absence of a skull, an assessment of the woman's race could not be made through anthropological methods. A DNA profile was entered into the CODIS system with no associations with any known missing persons. So after about five years of active investigation, the investigators could still not identify the victim and the case was put into cold case status. Oops. The, um, let me see. Yeah, in early 2019, a cold case unit was formed composed of retired Redondo Beach Police Department detectives working on a volunteer basis. The head of the cold case unit John, um, um, John Skipper and inquired with the California DOJ to see if uh, forensic genealogy could be used to identify their 2001 Jane Doe. The California DOJ representative recommended DNA Doe Project. The DNA Doe Project began work on the case in September of 2019, and the LA County Coroner's Office was able to provide a cross section of the femur bone for DNA extraction. But due to the badly degraded condition of the remains, it took two years and three labs to get a workable DNA profile. And in December of 2020, Astria Forensics was able to develop a usable profile, and that profile was loaded into the GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA data, um, databases. The initial assessment of the profile revealed that the bones belonged to a female of 96% of sub-Saharan African descent. So this was the first time that the investigators had any idea as to the racial background of the Jane Doe. Several of the persons who were listed as being related to her had familial connections to Holly Springs, Mississippi, 
a, a suburban community just southeast of Memphis, Tennessee. Another more distantly, a more, another more distant group of related persons, mostly of Northwestern European descent, had connections to the Simpson County area of central Mississippi. Upon building out the family trees of the Jed Match and family tree DNA uh, users with connections to Holly Springs, we discovered that several of them had led to one common ancestor. His name was Christopher Columbus Withers. He was known by his initials C.C. Withers. He was born in 1853 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. C.C. Withers had, had at least 15 children, most, most with his wife, Medora Faulkner, but some with other partners as well. Many of these children could be traced to living descendants in the current day, but others had very scant documentation other than census documents associating them with the Withers household. So several of the persons who were related to the Jane Doe on the side of her opposite parent had connections to Simpson County, Mississippi. All of these persons were predominantly of Caucasian descent. And upon building out the family trees of the Jed Match and family tree DNA users from this group, they led to a common ancestor, a plantation owner known as uh, named Moses Bridges and his wife, Sarah Hamrick, who lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Virtually all the known descendants of Moses Bridges and Sarah Hamrick were, were of Northern European descent with no discernible traces of African ancestry. We could only find one African American line of descendancy that shared common DNA with the other. Caucasian descendants of, of uh, Moses Bridges and Sarah Hamrick. It took us nearly two years to locate persons from the Bridges and Withers lines who were willing to provide us with a DNA sample. On the Bridges side, Redondo Beach PD Reserve investigator Mike Stark was able to contact a doctor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And after months of on and off communication about the family, he was very helpful, but he would not provide a sample of his DNA. After numerous attempts to find someone from that extended family who was willing to assist us, we located a man from Chicago who agreed to upload his ancestry test to GEDmatch. However, when his DNA results came in, we could see that his uh, connection to our Jane Doe was much more distant than we had expected. So that brings us back. With, with no options left on the Bridges side, we returned to uh, the Withers Holly Springs side. We had one match. A fourth generation or fourth great da uh, granddaughter of C.C. Withers, who measured at 132 centimorgans, suggesting about a third cousin level relation to the Jane Doe. This, the common ancestors connecting her to the Jane Doe were probably a generation or two closer than her relationship to C.C. Withers was. This woman's elderly grandmother was also a descendant of C.C. Withers and was still alive. So uh, getting a person two generations closer to test would have been an enormous benefit to our effort. They agreed to test, but the grandmother passed away before they got the opportunity to administer the test. And one of our other matches was a woman from San Antonio, Texas, who also measured at 132 centimorgans. We were unsure how she was related to C.C. Withers, except that her relation was on her paternal side. And her father, who was elderly and living in an assisted living facility in Gilroy, California, was willing to take the test, but his daughter could not administer the test because she was in Texas. So investigator Mike Stark drove over 300 miles to Gilroy to administer the test. The man in Gilroy tested at 517 centimorgans in comparison to the Jane Doe. This is almost, but not quite what one would expect from a full first cousins. He also shared 146 centimorgans on the X chromosome. And since this tester was male, the connection to the Jane Doe had to be on his maternal side because a male cannot inherit X chromosome segments by way of his father. Almost certainly, the Jane Doe was either a maternal side half first cousin, that is uh, with only one shared grandparent, or the child of a full first cousin. Um, but we found out that his mother only had three half siblings, two half si which included two half sisters and one half brother. And by way of those two half aunts and half uncle, the man in Gilroy had 13 maternal side half cousins. So here we have a little uh, diagram of how their family tree was constructed. And if you look over here, uh, up, up here in the upper right hand corner, you have Christopher Columbus Withers, CC Withers. Down below here, you have the man, the, the woman from San Antonio, 
And then above that is her father, the man in Gilroy. We knew it was his maternal side. And we later found out that his, that her mother was the granddaughter of C.C. Withers. So the man in Gilroy's uh, maternal grandfather was not the same uh, man as the, the father of the other three half siblings. Uh, their father's name was Benjamin Parker. So these three half siblings of, of this woman here uh, had in total 13 children. So it, it was very likely that one of these 13 children was our Jane Doe because they, um, these, three, these three persons were half, half aunts and a an, uh, half uncle to the man in Gilroy. So, um, oops, uh, the half aunt and half uncle also had uh, five siblings on their paternal side who were unrelated to the tester in Gilroy. And one of those was an 88 year old woman in New Jersey was still living and knew everyone in the family. Uh, there were about 13, about two of the 13 cousins whom she had not heard of since the 1970s. Um, whose current whereabouts were unknown. One of them, Christina Parker, uh, went to Chicago, she said, and the other, Catherine Parker, went to California, and she had not heard from him uh, since the 1970s. Uh, the woman in New Jersey also provided Mike Stark with a contact number for a sister of Christina and Catherine who was living in Memphis, Tennessee. It didn't take us long to figure out why the aunt in New Jersey had not heard from Christina Parker. This is a newspaper clipping from August of 1982 in the Chicago Tribune. In August of 1982, Christina Parker, then 33 years old, Christina's two daughters, Mary Ann, who was 15, and Cora, who was 13, and Mary Ann's son, Jante, who was three years old, and Christina's unborn child were all murdered by, him, by a young man named James Ely, who was Mary Ann's 17-year-old boyfriend. The murder occurred in their West Side Chicago apartment. The murders were motivated by his anger at being teased by Christina and Cora about an eye infection that he had at the time. So of the 13 cousins of the man in Gilroy, all were accounted for with the exception of one, Catherine Parker. Investigator Stark spoke by telephone with Catherine's sister and the sister, sister verified that Catherine had not been seen since the late 70s or early 80s. And they had a son and a daughter who also had not uh, seen or heard from her since they were young children. Catherine's sister and, and daughter both agreed to take ancestry tests and upload the test to GEDmatch for direct, direct, um, direct comparison to the Jane Doe's DNA profile. Catherine's daughter measured at 3,433 centimorgans against the Jane Doe profile, which indicated a parent-child relationship with 100% certainty. Catherine's sister's profile measured at 2,657 centimorgans against the Jane Doe profile, which indicated a full sibling relationship with 100% certainty. So they were both retested by authorities in Tennessee using official protocols, and the identity, identity was verified through the CODIS system. So who was Catherine Parker? Catherine Parker was born in November of 1957. Her mother died when Catherine was very young and her father was very neglectful of her. And she spent much of her early childhood in the foster care system. At the age of 16, she married a man named Van Johnson and they had two children, but Catherine started associating with a bad crowd and her marriage to Van Johnson didn't last. Catherine left Memphis, Tennessee around 1977 and traveled to California. Her daughter told investigators that Catherine was a drug addict and was living a difficult and marginalized lifestyle. And she br brief, brief, briefly returned to Memphis in May of 1981 to visit her two children and then returned to California. Her daughter received one more letter from her after that, sent from Inglewood, California, and her daughter never heard from her again. The law enforcement database has indicated numerous misdemeanor arrests, primarily drug-related in the Inglewood, Lenox area. Catherine's last law enforcement contact was when she was 23 years old in August of 1981. And despite numerous arrests prior to August 1981, no record of her existence after that could be found. Investigators have been unable to locate many of the police reports pertaining to her prior arrests, 
but they were still they're still in the process of trying to get various agencies to look up the actual documents, mugshots, et cetera, in connection with those arrests. The Redondo Beach PD cold case team is seeking information about any persons who traveled with Catherine to California or persons with whom she associated while she was living in California. The available records pertaining to her law enforcement contacts are completely lacking as to the names of any associates of hers. So I'll conclude this presentation by saying that the researchers at the DNA Doe Project are all volunteers, motivated only by our desire to deliver resolution to family members of missing persons. In most instances, these family members spend decades wondering whether their loved ones are alive or dead. Catherine had two children, the older, a daughter who had been wondering since she was eight years old why her mother never came home. Her son only had a few vague memories of her, and he too wondered what had happened. This can be devastating to the psyche and sense of self-worth to grow up with a lingering doubt about whether, whether something happened to her or whether she just decided that she didn't care about them. But knowing the truth still doesn't heal all the damage, but at least the healing process can begin. And it's very gratifying to me to be able to have a role in starting that healing process. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, what, I mean, being a, I guess, I guess Mark and I are both historians. Um, what you don't want to read about in history is decades later is a case that was never solved. Um, you mm -hmm. know, the, the, the hope is that no cases become history, at least become history because they haven't been solved. So um, mm -hmm. the fact that these cases like still have hope because of your work is truly remarkable and amazing. So um, I do have to commend you for your dedication as and everybody at the DNA Doe Project as a, for your volunteerism. That's And that's a lot amazing. of times, if you don't know the who the victim is, it's <laughs> very difficult to solve the crime as to who the perpetrator is because you know, in, in many of these cases, it, you know, the, the lifestyle or the, the, the patterns of the, of, of the victim, you know, are indicative of, of their killer. So um, without knowing who the victim is, it's very difficult to know who the perpetrator is. So yeah. that gives them a, a lot, a lot of uh, headway into ultimately solving this, this case as to who the, who put her bones in that backyard in Redondo Beach. And I know there are specific details because this is an ongoing case. There are some things that you can't discuss here um, because it would obviously compromise the case. Um, having said that, if anybody has any questions for Carl that we can answer um, tonight, you go. You can go ahead and put those in the chat and Q&A box um, and he will answer as best he can. Um, so I think I already have a couple here. Um, let's see, we've got how many cold cases have DNA samples that need to be processed in order to support investigation. So I guess that means like how many are lingering that need to be processed? Um, I think uh, by my last count, I think there were about 60 cases that are in the pipeline, but there are several others uh, where the sample is so badly degraded that they can't get a sample. So there are a few of those. Um, but, and that's just with DNA Doe Project right now. Yeah, and, and there are other organizations that do this as well and several labs and um, um, I'm, I follow the news on these things and there are cases announced uh, just about every day of, you know, there's an organization called Parabon that just came up with a, a soft case this morning of a Jane Doe case that I'd been following for, uh, mm -hmm. it was out in 1984. So uh, I was kind of excited to see that that had been resolved because I'd been following that case for quite a long time. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a matter of, you know, sometimes, particularly in the L.A. County, L.A. County has always cremated their remains of all their indigents and unidentifieds. So in many cases, for some of these cases that are decades old, they don't have any more biological material left and they can't exhume the remains because there's a uh, there's a public uh, a county crematorium over on First and uh, Lorena, just uh, in Boyle Heights, where all the indigents and identified unidentifieds are taken and cremated and buried in uh, in common graves, marked only by a year, the year of death. So, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. So 
yeah, recently they've been a little better about, you know, if it's a more recent case, they've been better about, you know, saving um, material for later testing. But, but you know, if the, the case dates back to the 70s or 60s, uh, there's probably nothing left. And of those 60 cases you guys are working on, um, are where are they predominantly based? California, Los Angeles? I know you oh, guys they're all do over work the country. We, yeah. we get cases from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And in Canada as well. We have a few cases in Canada. So, oh, uh, okay. Very interesting. Um, since more people are doing DNA testing and family genealogy, um, I feel like, especially like, you know, with new generations turning over, um, uh, more people are getting interested in it. Um, do you expect that that'll help solve more cold cases? The more people that are, you know, looking for family ancestry and contributing DNA? Oh yeah. I mean, the people are becoming more aware of this, uh, resource, uh, you know, constantly there's more people becoming aware of it and the more people that put their DNA into the system, you know, the the more um, robust the, the database becomes and much more easy to solve these cases. And I should use that point to make the plug that if you have taken a test in, say, Ancestry or 23andMe, uh, it would be very, very helpful to our effort to download those results into the GEDmatch database, because that's where the um, unidentified remains cases are compared to, um, oh, okay. to the users. Uh, Ancestry and 23andMe doesn't allow law enforcement to use their databases for that purpose. So we have to use this uh, database called GEDmatch or Family Tree DNA also allows their database to be used for that purpose. But all of the other ones, uh, uh, that's not part of their terms of service. So their ter terms of service forbid the use of uh, you know, law enforcement uh, unidentified remains cases or crime scene mm -hmm. evidence uh, to be used in their database. Which that's good to mention, because I know a lot of younger people do use 23andMe. Um, I know mm -hmm. my husband did, so that's good to know. So you can still, if you're willing to contribute, you can still download yeah, those Yeah, if you have no objection to, mm -hmm. you know, your yeah. DNA being used for that purpose, uh, we strongly <laughs> urge that, you know, there's a process that you can do to take uh, your DNA just to download onto your computer, and then you can upload it into GenMatch, and it's free, and it's free of charge uh, to, to upload to GenMatch. And there are a few uh, tools that you that are free of charge, and I think there's a ten dollar a month charge if you want to use the more advanced tools, but mm -hmm. um, but it's an excellent resource for yeah. genealogy research as well. In addition to, you know, the the uh, more well known companies, uh, Ancestry, mm -hmm. Twenty Three and Me, and My Heritage, and yeah, and the others. And oh, this is a, an interesting one. Um, so, are you familiar with the future of placing DNA on blockchain technology? If so, what can you tell us about this? What are your thoughts? blockchain technology <laughs> I've never i have heard no of. idea oh yeah. <laughs> yeah you got me stumped on that one <laughs> uh oh okay all right that that's a stump so i mean um, we're gonna I, have yeah, to look that up <laughs> i mean i know they're all looking into using ai to uh um to come up with methods of automatically mm -hmm. building family trees based on just you know a comparison of two people but uh i don't know how far along that uh, effort is it's I know there's a lot of talk about that ultimately being a goal, but you know, with yeah, all it this, seems like yeah. there's still a few steps that would require kind of like human discernment. Um, but you know, yeah. technology yeah. moves faster than we do. So, <laughs> yeah. and then, um, so I, one thing you didn't mention, well, I think you briefly mentioned it that you do, um, a lot of like forensic artwork and like facial reconstruction. Um, so what's the process to create an image from forensic evidence, um, you know, as far as updating old photos and a more current image, um, how, what's the, in a nutshell, how oh, do you I, do I, that? Yeah, I got kind of started with that, just, you know, using photos that were available online. There's a site called NamUs that, um, that lists unidentified uh, remains cases. And in a lot of these cases, actual photos of the unidentified person are provided, coroner's photos or, or um, and that and such. And, um, in some cases, all they have is a skull. And I, back in, I think, the 2010, I just out of, on a whim decided to start trying to see if I could create, uh, you know, living portrayals of these persons and using these coroner's photos and skull photos. And basically what I do is I just take photos of living persons and it, it's just kind of a composite process. And 
and it takes about a day and you know you have to keep repeating the same process over and over again until it, it develops into a uh, um you know a, pro a portrayal of a living person but i've kind of developed my techniques on that i i didn't have any kind of training on it it was all kind of self-taught i just have a copy of corel photo paint on my computer and i just started developing my capability with that software and and my techniques and ultimately i just kept getting better and now now i have people actually as you know agencies and coroner's offices actually asking me to um to do portrayals of some of the doe do cases that they have on on file yeah i mean it's always worth it uh, to try you never know what it's going to key in someone's brain when they see it um something they'll mm -hmm. remember so it's definitely a valuable thing to do yeah. so many of these cases are being solved not because they recognize my image but because of forensic genealogy <laughs> now <laughs> but uh, you know i've had so many of these cases on my facebook page and and you know one by one they're getting knocked off by forensic genealogy but you know I, when they are ultimately identified i can actually do a side by side and say okay i did pretty good on this one or you know, no i didn't do so good on that one but, uh, <laughs> you know it's uh <laughs> yeah yeah i know there was i can't remember which one it was i think it was was it buckskin girl or one of them i was i was like wow that was actually really close good job carl <laughs> it was yeah, a good one flat, i was pretty pleased with you know especially the the more recent photo of her where she was a bridesmaid at her friend's wedding yeah um, mm -hmm. yeah that photo <laughs> actually does you know strongly resemble the image that I did so I was very pleased with uh, mm -hmm. how that one came out there are mm -hmm. others that you know the resemblance isn't as good as I want it's, it's it's hit and miss but you know a lot of it depends on you know the condition of the image that you're starting with but mm -hmm. um, and I've got an, kind of an interesting one here um I mean the the individual admits it's a bit of far afield but um as far as um like how do you take what what does it look like to take DNA samples from an, an explosion site? Um, how do you locate even locate DNA samples? Um, what does that look like um, for processing? Um, I know that's well, a little I, bit. Yeah, that that's yeah, definitely that requires an a little one. expertise. I don't have, but I I'm, they do have mm -hmm. ways of uh, you know identifying human remains. I don't know what their equipment is, or you know, like for example the you know, the 9-11 World Trade Center's site, they were, mm -hmm. you know, finding human remains that are just minuscule in size, and and they're still, you know, they're still identifying. So I just read, like, a month ago, they they were able to identify a small bit of bone or, you know, a small quantity of human remains, and they were able to identify the person. Um, yeah. So I... Um, and yeah. then um, as far as like the organization in general, like DNA Doe Project, um, we have a couple of people asking, you know, what kind of qualifications do you need to volunteer? Um, or also what can people do to help support what you folks are doing? Um, are there any legislation, legislative measures that um, people should be keeping an eye on? Um, you know, how can we support um, with the work that you guys are doing? There, there are um, legislative measures. I don't know the specifics of them. They're, they're, they're working on you know, getting with the state, state and uh, federal agencies to try to get uh, uh, get them to uh, use, utilize this method uh, more broadly than they have been. Uh, yeah, as far as what people can do, I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, you can go to the dnadoeproject.org and they have a means by which you can donate if you want to donate to the organization. Uh, there's uh and and as i said uh i said earlier you know we we're constantly urging people to download to gedmatch because especially with minority subjects because they tend to be underrepresented in the gedmatch database uh, the data database is overly represented with you know caucasian uh caucasians of you know several generations americans and uh uh, underrepresented with uh, you know Hispanics and Blacks and Asians. So, um, but people of all all uh, backgrounds, we urge that they download to the GEDmatch database because it, you know, the more people in the in the uh, database, the the easier it makes our our work. Yeah, definitely. And then, what kind of qualifications do you need to volunteer? Is um how 
can somebody get involved with um, directly um, helping? You, yeah, you can fill out an application on the DNA Deal Project site, but they tend to oh. bring in people with backgrounds and people who've done family searches. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people who do adoption searches uh, um, usually, you know, have a have a good shot at uh, joining, you know, being being taken in as a as a volunteer. There's a there's a large number of people who have, who have filed and and requested so they can't accept everybody who requests but you know if you have a background in uh in any kind of a subject that is relevant to uh what we do whether it's you know might be uh investigative if you have a you know some sort of a law enforcement enforcement or investigative background uh those people usually have a leg up or you know as i said if you've done um if you've helped adoptees find their biological families, if you've been involved in that process. Um, gotcha. And how do you spell the for the database? Um, how do you spell Gen Match? Is it? Oh, it's Jed G E D okay. Jed Match. So it's uh, JedMatch.org, I believe. Yes, JedMatch.org. Let me double check that with <laughs> make sure I got it right. But uh, <laughs> well, while you're checking, I mean, the reason we have Mark here is because he's also um very like involved in doing work with the. Uh, ancestry.com which it's like especially after this presentation um it's just like such an amazing resource and it, it was actually mark that kind of um turned me on to looking at the public record re, you know databases that are available that connect directly with um, ancestry.com it's quite amazing it's for anything by, it's jedmatch.com by the way not .org <laughs> okay perfect sure i got that right gotcha. it's jedmatch.com g-e-d-m-a-t-c-h.com Perfect. Okay, so and now everybody you can, you can sign, you can uh, join for free, and you know the process. There is a pretty easy process to download. If you have an ancestry test already, you can just download from Ancestry or Twenty Three and Me or any of those sites and upload gotcha. straight into GEDmatch, and then they're available for for our purposes. Very cool. Okay, and and also I should point out that if you if you want your test compared to those, but you're, you have, for whatever reason, an objection to being used in criminal cases, there's also an opt-out process to opt out oh, okay. being compared in criminal cases. The The Doe cases aren't subject to the opt-in, opt-out process, but criminal cases are. So if you put your test in GEDmatch and flag it as opt-out, you will still be compared to DOE cases, but not to criminal cases. That's good to know, because I know a lot of people, um, you know, want to, you know, have control over how that stuff is used. So mm -hmm. um, that that would actually be like a big factor that might change someone's mind to, to participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark, did you have any other questions? No questions. Do we want to talk about the other thing we're trying, we're going to offer? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, Mark and Carl, I know that you guys are friends, but um, Mark, I know you've done, um, so like for instance, back when we did the Prouty exhibit, you were able to, about the Prouty house on the Strand, you were able to find the current relatives of that family through using, making a family tree in Ancestry.com. So um, so we're also kind of using it for historical purposes to find current relatives of historic families in town. Um, so, um, but in, during this process, I also, if you don't know Carl, like I, I connect, I was, I realized how good Mark is at familyancestry.com. Um, it is like, <laughs> it is clearly a skill that you two have like absolutely fine tuned. Um, so I think um, it's something that a lot of people are interested in. So um, what did you want to do? I'm, I'm hoping that we do this in January, Mark, because um, every, a lot of people give like DNA testing kits at Christmas. So I think it'd be a um, great time. Yeah, so basically, um, my dad was a, our family genealogist, and we have bookshelves of paper, you know, and back in the day, you would have to mail in forms to county records and different databases to try and collect records. But now, all these records, or I shouldn't say all, but most of these records, census data, marriage certificates, death certificates, birth certificates, they're all digitized now. And so if you have an ancestry.com, um, there's some pretty good techniques that I was gonna explain to people uh, that have an ancestry.com on how to build up a family tree fairly quickly 
and then utilize um, different resources that are available online primarily to tie in information about individuals within the family tree. And, you know, traditionally, um, a lot of genealogists were happy to get date of birth and date of death, maybe, and maybe a marriage date. But nowadays, you can, with online resources, you can really build up a, um, a story about a person's life. And I use Ancestry.com as kind of my uh, chronological database for adding in information and photos and records of different kinds to try and give a complete story about um, a person within a family tree. And so um, Jamie's seen me do this with some historical figures in the past that were related to Hermosa Beach and how I was able to go back in the past and pull together uh, information about an individual. And then like she said, even find living descendants that um, that in some cases have been able to contribute information about the person that we're researching since the family had records that weren't publicly available. So it's it's very interesting if if you're trying to build out a family tree and ancestry, um, I was gonna host like a, a free seminar and kind of give ancestry.com 101 lessons and share some of the techniques that I've used to gather information about individuals within a family tree. Also, incidentally, if you don't feel like spending the money on the on, a, on an ancestry account, there's a familysearch.com uh, is free. Is free. You just have to sign up, and so it's actually run by the Church of Latter Day Saints. But it's a ah uh, yeah free site, and it's uh there's an enormous amount of uh, research material. I use it quite often, just particularly with Hispanic cases, because they have records going back to, in some cases, the 1600s on births, marriages, and deaths in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, this case that I'm currently working on uh, involves a woman, a Hispanic woman who was murdered in 1980. But um, we've located close family members in Zacatecas, Mexico, and you know we have, you know, we've been able to find an enormous amount of information from which we can build family trees um, in familysearch.com and, yeah, and, and there's back uh, to uh, you know the 1700s and sometimes even earlier mm -hmm. and and now there's uh, a few different websites that have digitized newspapers so um, you can actually search uh, names of family members into newspapers that go back to the 1700s now in some areas mm -hmm. so there's so many online resources and um, I thought I might be able to help people kind of leapfrog their research into, you know, finding information quicker than if you did it by trial and error, like I've done over the last several years. And I think it's worthwhile. Um, I'm a very lucky person that I know so much about my family history. I can tell you all about the personality of people I never met. Um, but even then, Mark got me to get a newspapers.com account, and I found all kinds of stuff about my grandparents that I had never read about. So um, I think no matter how much you think you know, you can find stuff that is uh, really worthwhile um, to find. And then kind of on the, you know, in line with the forensic side, um, I've done a DNA test. And because I have an extensive uh, family genealogy online with Ancestry, I've been approached a few times by uh, distant relatives that knew we were related through DNA. And we've been able to kind of go back uh, through our family trees and find common ancestors. And in some cases, uh, I've helped people find parents that they didn't know who they who their parents were and and that type of thing. So it's it's interesting that it's it's not just um, you know, doing DNA doe type research that this this DNA database is 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 enabling, but it's also helping people find lost relatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Although now you're really kind of marketing yourself as a good volunteer for the DNA doe project. So you better be careful what you say for the <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I mean there's a lot of people who've been adopted and have always wondered, you know, who their biological parents are and whether their, you know, mother's still alive or you know, a lot of these things have been resolved through. Yeah, I, I, have a, I have a very good friend who uh, 
in the last couple of years found out that he had two uh, 60s love children and uh, they've reunited and they're now one big happy family. It's kind of funny just on this on a same similar note just just last uh, I think it was Saturday or Sunday I was sitting in the McDonald's and some got in a chat with this guy and he was talking about how it's uh, you know he only met his father once and you know didn't really know whether he had have siblings or not. And I said, well, here, give me your information. I'll go see what I can find. I ended up finding a living brother on him. And just about an hour before this meeting, he called me up and said, oh, I found my brother. I had a t I talked to him for an hour. And, uh, you know, the, just, I mean, it wasn't through DNA I found him, but I, you know, I went on my online resources, my people search site and yeah. found an obituary for his other brother and or half brother. And um, he was really excited because, you know, he's like 70 years old and didn't know if he still had any living siblings so that's yeah. really remarkable there's just so much information online and again like even if you think you know everything I think it's worth checking into some of these uh, databases just for I mean just for fun um mm -hmm. so because you know you don't know what you're gonna find so but but that is a caveat sometimes you you find interesting things that you weren't expecting so you have to be you have to do you have to be a little bit open to what you yeah, may there, uncover. There, there are skeletons in the closets. <laughs> At, well, absolutely, because no family is perfect, no matter how they may look from the other side of the street. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any more questions, but Mark, I'm really excited for this webinar that you're absolutely going to do in January. I think it'll be really fun. Um, we'll have to pick a case study for you to use as a as a, a sample. Um, I, think, I think we should get people to sign on and then... Um... I might be able to do a little preliminary research to kind of, uh, you know, make it, I, I have envisioned kind of doing it almost like live mm -hmm. to kind of show people the processes, but if yeah. I could do some, if I had some background ahead of time, I could kind of show how to, to quickly build up a family tree and then, and then fill in information. Like I said, it's, it's one thing to know date of birth and date of death, but when you could start using online resources to find out what professions people were involved in, or athletics, or you know, any type of you know activity that someone was involved in with their life, it just adds so much more value to the family tree. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope that Carl will you know double check your presentation to make sure that everything looks good since he's the leading expert. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I bow to the professor. <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 great. I'm sure I know Family Ancestry was originally intended as a, a historical resource, but I love that it's helping um, the DNA Doe project shine a light on the past. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Carl. Um, okay. This well, was like you. really awesome. So I hope I hope that we'll have you back at some point for something else because um, this is just like eternally interesting to me. Um, okay. Really awesome. So Carl is like, I know, I know. Maybe I'll think about it. So. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Mark, no for and thank you, Mark, for introducing us to Carl and helping get him here tonight. Um, really appreciate it. And as somebody else just commented, um, can't wait for Ancestry 101. So, <laughs> so you're okay. you're already you're already in it. It's gonna happen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everybody that tuned in tonight. Um, we are going to be posting a recording of this later on. Um, so I would actually say watch it again because I've now watched this presentation twice and I picked up a lot more the second time around as well. So if you feel like that was a lot of information, watch the recording once it's posted next week. So that's going to be my recommendation. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a good night and we'll see you online soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.